Duplication of Benefit webinar. Today we'll be providing all of you with an overview of duplication of benefit for all CDBG CV awards. There's a few housekeeping items that I'd like to cover before we roll into introductions. This webinar will be recorded and we will distribute the recording, slides, and any additional relevant materials soon after to all registered attendees. The materials will also be posted to our website for free access for everyone. All attendees are automatically muted for this webinar. If you could please introduce yourself and your organization in the chat feature, that would be great so we can get an overview of who is here. Any questions about duplication of benefit should be entered into the Q&A feature and we will address all questions after the presentation to ensure good flow of the presentation and we will try our best to address all questions. If it is a more specific project question, we may contact you separately. Awesome, thank you everyone. For today's introductions, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Alex Jetty and I'm the Compliance Manager for CDFA. I'd also like to introduce Chris Monroe. He is our Community Development Manager and he's the manager for all the public service CDBG CV projects. Kevin Peterson, I think he's also here, and he is the project manager for all of the micro enterprise CDBG CD projects. I will now hand over control to Dan and allow him to introduce himself and kick off the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Alex. It's great to be here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our discussion over the concept of duplication of benefits resulting from excess assistance from federal and other sources that you or a subrecipient may be receiving as part of this COVID-19 relief. Um, today, as Alex mentioned, it's gonna be the focus on the aid and funding that recipients will receive for the prevention of preparation for and response to COVID-19 within New Hampshire. Um, this is brought to you by the New Hampshire CDFA. Um, CDFA brought myself along, I'll give my introduction here in a minute to present on this topic. So I know a lot of you are familiar with the CDFA. So knowing that they are the state agency that administers the annual federal allocation of community development block grant funds. Um, so I'll be referring to those as CDBG. Um, I know all the acronyms are fantastic here. Um, so these funds, you know, applied for and used by eligible municipalities, cities, counties, et cetera. And of course, the primary objective of the CDFA is the development of viable communities by improving economic opportunities, meeting community revitalization needs, particularly for, pers for persons of low and moderate income, so LMI. So as we go along with introductions, my name is Daniel Schneider. I am with Green Forensic Accounting Solutions. We are based out of Chicago, Illinois, and we are a CPA and consulting firm with offices in Chicago and Las Vegas. Uh, we specialize in forensic accounting, internal examinations, and training services, just like this one. Uh, so we work with a wide variety of clientele, including governmental agencies, like I said, cities, counties, states, tribal nations, publicly and privately held business entities, and not-for-profit organizations. So I'm currently a certified public accountant, a certified internal auditor and certified fraud examiner. And I have experience at large public accounting firms, state agencies and accounting and finance departments. And as a auditor of the state, I was with the state of Iowa back when I first started my career. So as Alex mentioned with the CDFA here today is Alex and Chris Monroe, um, they're kind of going to be your key contacts at the CDFA. If you have questions either on this presentation, on your funding, on you know specific questions over duplication of benefits, as well as I will be around assisting Alex and Chris if there are specific questions over the calculation framework here on duplication of benefits. Um, we'll kind of go into the agenda here, and we'll kind of briefly go over New Hampshire CDFA, CDFA's role, which most of you know the CDFA team already, so they'll be happy to answer all your questions and touch on, I'm sorry, they'll be happy to answer all your questions after this. Next, we'll touch on CDBG assistance. 
Uh, we'll touch on the Stafford Act and how the act is the regulating federal assistance and requires the review and calculation relating to the duplication of benefits and kind of where all this starts with. Then we will start our deep dive into the duplication of benefits framework and calculation. Uh, that's going to be the bulk of what I will be discussing today. And then at the end, we will have some basic examples to kind of go over how the framework works. And then, of course, at the end, some questions. Um, I know a lot of you will have some good specific questions to your specific needs. Um, during this presentation, we don't want to get too bogged down in the weeds over certain, certain questions like that. As Alex mentioned, um, if it does get a little specific and not pertaining to the general audience, Alex and I will get back to you specifically and individually. Um, if you do have kind of general questions over the framework, we'd be happy to answer them now. Um, we know a few people did send in some questions prior as they registered for this event, more regarding the PPP loan and how that may or may not affect the duplication of benefits and funding coming from this COVID relief. So there are a couple slides in here, in here at the end to cover that. So we'll kind of start off with the CDFA's role with the COVID-19 relief process. As the administrator of the federal funds, the CDFA directly awards the CDBG resources to New Hampshire's cities, towns, and counties, which often subgrant that money to the nonprofit agency or, or other entity that's actually going to conduct the work. So every state has their own CDFA equivalent to do this work and administer the funds for distribution. So if you ever do move to another state, there will be a equivalent, and most of them are called CDFAs. You just got to figure out state by state. For this program, the CDBG COVID funds for COVID-19 pandemic relief was allocated as part of the CARES Act as passed by Congress in March 2020, so almost a year ago now. So New Hampshire was allocated about $5.4 million as part of this public assistance program. You know, the CARES Act gave multiple federal agencies the ability to distribute monies for certain services. So this includes, you know, the Treasury Department, HUD, which is what the CDFA gets their money from. Uh, there's the Small Business Association, the IRS, and even the USDA as part of the CARES Act. Each agency does have their own specific populations to serve and their own specific purposes. So as I mentioned, the CDFA is really for municipalities and improving revitalization within the state. So a quick overview of you know, how the funding does flow. You know, it's gonna start with HUD, the Housing and Urban Development. They provide the funds to the CDFA the CDFA takes those applications from eligible applicants, which is going to be the cities, counties, municipalities, who and then distribute funds to the subrecipients, the nonprofits and agencies. They'll either do the work or even subgrant it out to end users, you know, the micro enterprises. A brief overview of the CARES Act, of course, you know, where did this all come from? And then here are a couple examples of the different grants that are part of the CARES Act, you know, where the CDBG does fall in. Uh, so like I mentioned, there is the SBA. The SBA does a few different items, including the Economic Injury, Injury Disaster Loan. They do the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. Uh, there's the CDBG and then the Economic Development Assistance Program. So again, these are just some of the grants, some of the money that the CARES Act brought forth for this COVID-19 relief. So breaking it down even further, there are four types of grants seen on the previous slide. They'll outline the CDBG funds here. So every grant has their specific purpose and these funds are to be used specifically for the prevention of preparation for and response to COVID-19. I know that's a pretty broad statement. So like any grant documentation is gonna be the key, which we'll kind of talk about as we get down into the framework. 
Here, we're going to kind of show how it's used and how it relates to COVID-19 for the ad revenue recipients, and then how the funds are scheduled to be allocated within New Hampshire for the community needs segments. So the first part is public services. So these are the municipal municipalities can access approximately $3.7 million in funds to support eligible public services. This is gonna be childcare, food banks, legal services, as well as health, mental health and substance abuse programs among others. This is, you know, New Hampshire cities, counties and towns still grant these to the nonprofits serving the communities. The next section is the micro enterprise technical assistance. So this is an allocation to New Hampshire of about $850,000. It will be dedicated to augmenting the existing technical assistance program to provide eligible New Hampshire micro enterprises with direct grants up to $2,500. The next one is the economic development. So New Hampshire got approximately $500,000 in funds to support development needs in 2021. And then finally, the emergency housing and public facilities. So this is response and recover for the COVID-19 pandemic and work in that method, you know, as I mentioned with the health, mental health, substance abuse. We'll touch on the Stafford Act. You know, the Stafford Act was brought forth in 1988. And it's the primary legal authority establishing the framework to provide disaster and emergency assistance. So anytime the government declares a disaster, they reference back to the Stafford Act. And what they do is they bring forth what they call the Federal Register. The Federal Register outlines what the disaster is and kind of and the specific relief that's going to be set forth and it also provides certain rules and regulations for that disaster. It's either timing, it's going to be the duplication of benefits, it's going to be who is the eligible applicants and recipients of funds, among many other items. The specific section that we'll be kind of talking about is section 312. And this is what lays out the framework for the disaster emergency assistance, as well as what grantees must present regarding duplication of benefits when they're administering funds. So there's a laid out a couple specific sections within there. Um, you know, it's not the most fun read in the world. It's very governmental. So as everyone kind of understands that, but it is very specific on what needs to be done as far as duplication of benefits. And reading more into the Stafford Act, there are certain items to pay attention to. You know, people and agencies administering these funds must make specific inquiries into the possible duplication of benefits of the recipients. It's, it's very clear in the Stafford Act that it's not enough to assume the recipient is acting appropriately and further, the recipient can't provide the administrator a blanket statement saying they're in compliance or no duplication of benefits exists. So you, a recipient can't just say, yes, I have policy and procedures in place. There's going to be no DOB. Kind of go away and we'll take it from here. There's going to be very specific inquiries. The recipients need to keep very clear records and documentation. So HUD or the CDFA or the grantor does make those specific inquiries, the grantee should be able to provide the documentation right up front. So it must be shown in some form the categories of income, their uses, and the grantee is not being duplicative in their, in their use. So it is a pretty straightforward idea for duplication of benefits. The recipients of funds need to tell the administrator what's going on, where the funds are coming from, and what are their uses. And then the administrators can verify and check this. So as long as everyone provides the best information they can, everything can run smoothly. And the final part is 
The grantee is required to develop and maintain adequate procedures to prevent a duplication of benefits that address each activity and program. So that's laid out in the Stafford Act. It's directed right at the grantee saying, again, you can't just make a blanket statement. You have to develop and maintain these procedures and document the best way possible. So we'll kind of get into the heart of this presentation, um, which is what is duplication of benefits and how does the framework actually work? So duplication of benefits is a relatively simple methodology, but it does take a bit of practice and patience to make sure you get it right. So to, so to define duplication of benefits, a duplication occurs when a beneficiary receives assistance from multiple sources for a cumulative amount that exceeds the total need for a particular recovery purpose. A quick example for this, you know, a recipient needs to pay for a home down payment after a disaster, and that down payment is $20,000. They are eligible and receive assistance from two different sources, totaling $30,000. Seeing both of these assistants are going to be for the same use, they have $10,000 as a duplication. So as stated here on the slide, the federal government, the CDFA eligible recipients, they all want to provide everybody as much money as possible and to assist the end users, but also be as responsible as possible with taxpayer money. So we'll jump into the actual framework here. And there's Pretty simple steps. So this slide shows those key points of the duplication of benefits framework, outlining how a recipient or administrator will show what, if any, duplications are identified or not. So the first step is assess applicant need. You know, how much money does the applicant need to do everything they need to do? Identify the total assistance exclude the non-duplicative amounts. That'll result in identifying the duplication of benefit amounts, and it'll calculate the total award maximum. And then the final step, which is kind of the key step, is reassess unmet need when necessary. This is a moving target. So you need to understand, you know, if you get funds today, what do you have, what may be duplicate? And down the road, you'll need to reassess. So you may increase your duplication, you may decrease your duplication, it can go in different directions, but the reassessment is going to be a kind of a key step. So we'll kind of dig deeper now into each step of this framework and discuss some of the finer points that are within each. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we'll take some general questions here today at the end, and then some specific situational questions. If you have those about your specific funds, they could be submitted to myself in the CDFA. It will work with the individuals afterwards and do the best research we can and come up with the best responses and answers to those questions as we can. So as shown in the previous slide, the first step in determining if there is any duplication of benefits is to assess the applicant's total needs. So the total need is calculated based on an assessment at a point in time. Now total need is the current need. Generally, this total need is calculated without regard to any program specific caps or maximums on the amount of assistance that they can receive. Um, an example is for rehabilitation, reconstruction, or new construction activities. You know, this is relatively easy to determine. You know, if you're just going to build a house, there is your construction cost estimates. That's your total need. Uh, for recovery programs of the grantee that do not, you know, entail physical rebuilding, such as special economic development activities to provide an effective business with working capital, um, that's kind of what we're going to see here with the COVID relief. Um, the total need is going to be determined 
by the requirements or parameters of the program and activity. The grantee's assessment of the total need must consider in-kind donations of materials or services that are known to the grantee at the time it calculates the need. So an in-kind donation are gonna be non-cash contributions, such as donations of professional services, use of someone else's equipment, contribution of other materials, et cetera. So if someone loans you a truck or a piece of equipment or something else to help your business recover from the COVID-19, you that total is that kind of that amount market value should be included in your total needs calculation. So the next step is identifying total assistance. So you know how much you need. And now we know, now we need to figure out how much can you get to fill that need. So total assistance is going to include resources such as cash awards, insurance proceeds, grants such as the CDBG, and loans. Loans received by or available to each applicant. You know, these loans could be state, local, federal programs, um, other awards from private or nonprofit profit charity organizations, anywhere a prudent person may be able to receive money for their assistance in this COVID relief. At a minimum, the grantee's efforts to identify total assistance must include a review to determine whether the applicant received HUD, SBA, insurance, or other major forms of assistance available to the applicant. Uh, one key to note, total assistance does not include personal assets. So if a proprietor of the business provides their own personal assets, such as money in a checking or savings account, a retirement account, credit cards and line of credit, that does not work into the total assistance. So total assistance is gonna come from the outside world from the business. So total assistance includes what is called available assistance. So available assistance is assistance if the applicant would have received it in by acting in a reasonable manner, or in other words, by taking the same practical steps toward funding recovery as would disaster survivors face with the same situation. So if the assistance is out there, the business or proprietor needs to be prudent and understand everything that's out there and what is available to them. Obviously there is this COVID relief, but again, I know some of you questioned the PPP loans, um, any other loans, grants, insurance, that is all included into this total assistance. So available assistance includes reasonably anticipated assistance that has been awarded and accepted, but has not yet been received. So for example, if a local government seeks CDBG assistance to fund part of a project that has also been awarded FEMA funds, the entire FEMA award must be included in the calculation of total assistance, even if FEMA obligates the first award increment for the project, but subsequent increments remain unfunded until project milestones are met. So in other words, if FEMA says, we'll give you $100,000 in total in $10,000 increments based on either timing or percent of project completion, the entire $100,000 is part of the total assistance. So kind of the key is, you know, applicants for CDBG assistance are expected to seek insurance and other assistance to which they are legally entitled under existing policies and contracts and to behave reasonably when negotiating payments to which they may be entitled. So for instance, if you have insurance 
an insurance offers you X dollars, the person should not negotiate to an extent where insurance will deny a claim. Um, obviously, the proprietor and business will negotiate and try and get as much as possible, but they cannot be, you know, behave reasonably is kind of the key. In, So the next step, identifying any duplication of benefit amounts and calculate the total award. So any assistance provided for a different purpose than the CDBG eligible activity or a general non-specific purpose and not used for the same purpose is excluded from the total assistance when calculating the duplication of benefits. Assistance provided for the same purpose as the CDBG grants here must be included when calculating the amount of the duplication of benefits if the, applic if the applicant can document that the actual specific use of the assistance was an allowable use of that assistance and was different than the use of the CDBG funds. So again, this is the documentation of where are all my funds coming from? Do they have specific purposes? And do any of those specific purposes overlap in any manner? So grantees are advised to consult with the CDFA to determine what documentation is appropriate in some of these circumstances. Um, at the end, and as I mentioned, we'll talk about the PPP loans. Um, there may be overlaps, there may be not. Um, again, it's very determined on what you're going to be using your CDBG funds for. Now, as starting point, grantees should consider whether the source of assistance requires beneficiaries to maintain documentation of how the assistance was used. Um, myself, I would always say, always document, document, document. It can only help you. So then kind of the final step here is the reassess unmet need when necessary. Often unmet needs do not become apparent until the assistance has been provided. Um, some of the examples is a subsequent disaster or further preparation or help from COVID relief is there. Um, and that causes further damage or further need that a person may identify. So these further unmet needs are going to change. Also, if resources be, more resources become available to pay for the cost of activities. So kind of restate that is one, the actual needs of the recipient changes, or two, additional assistance becomes available. So we know there's CDBG funds right now, but in the future, if Congress does pass another stimulus bill or a CARES Act part two, that may show additional funds available. That's where this reassessment will need to come in. Because again, we go back to Total assistance is what a prudent, reasonable person will be able to obtain, what they're legally allowed to apply for and they're eligible for. So to the extent that an original disaster recovery need was not fully met or was exasperated by factors beyond the control of the applicant, the grantee may provide additional CDBG funds to meet the increased unmet need. Grantees must be able to, again, identify and document additional unmet needs. So as the needs meet, you know, document those as part of this duplication of benefits framework and revise any costs to um, fulfill those needs.
So here I'll kind of go over a few exceptions that may be, and this is where the PPP loans will come in. Uh, and this is what we call subsidized loans and exceptions. In a duplication of benefits calculation, you know, private loans are not considered a form of assistance and should not be considered when calculating the duplication of benefits. So a private loan is a direct loan a business gets from a bank, you know, something that's not directed by the federal government. However, subsidized loans from the SBA or FEMA should be included in the duplication of benefits analysis, unless there's one of these exceptions. So if the short-term subsidized loans from the SBA it's going to be reimbursed with CDBG funds. So the SBA gives you $10,000, knowing you're going to get $10,000 from the CDBG, that first SBA loan is not considered part of form of the total assistance because it's just that bridge loan to cover you for the month or two while your CDBG application is going through and those funds will be dispersed. Um, secondly, you know, declined or canceled subsidized loans. So if you apply for an SBA or FEMA loan and you are declined or you or the agency cancel the loan before it's dispersed, then it is not part of the total assistance. And then again, loan assistance is used toward a loss suffered as a result of the major disaster or major disaster or emergency. So again, the number one example of a subsidized loans will be the SBA's economic injury disaster loan or the paycheck protection program. So again, the PPP, uh, I know a couple people had questions on this. Uh, PPP funds had very specific uses and that's gonna be eligible payroll payments on business mortgage, interest, rent, and utilities. So this is the original CARES Act from March of 2020. I know what Congress just passed a few weeks ago did do a second round of PPP loans so that I didn't have that direct information into this presentation here today. Um, my understanding is, is fairly similar. Um, I know the forgiveness on the second round, they're making it a little bit easier based on the dollar amount to be forgiven. So if you're under $150,000 PPP loan, it's a fairly simple forgiveness application. But like I said, that I didn't have all the details, so I didn't want to give incorrect information. So again, the PPP from March of 2020, this is a borrower can apply for forgiveness once it used all the loan up, anytime up into the maturity date of the loan. So if you get $100,000, you use the $100,000, you could apply for the forgiveness anytime up into that maturity date of the loan. So if the loan only lasts you the eight weeks and you have the additional time to apply for forgiveness, you can apply any time in that time frame. The key here is these SBA PPP loans can be counted towards the total assistance line item within this duplication of benefits calculation. Because the CDBG is a fairly broad statement as far as the use, like I said, it's the, CD, the COVID relief is the prevention of, preparation for, and response to COVID-19. So again, a broad statement on the CDBG grants, and with the SBA, it's gonna be pretty specific. Again, it comes back to documentation of how are all these going to be used, and do they overlap in any fashion? to give some resources to everybody. So those, those were the five steps of 
dupl the duplication of benefits framework. Again, pretty straightforward methodology. It does take some practice, and I do have some examples here at the end that I'm going to kind of walk through. But just to give some resources, hopefully everyone knows the New Hampshire CDFA and their website. They do have a lot of resources, a lot of the COVID relief resources. Um, The next step would be, you know, what are eligible activities for state CDBG? Um, this comes from HUD. So it has their website and then just some general HUD resources for CDBG COVID relief. Again, a lot of resources, they have a couple worksheets that can help with duplication of benefits as well. And kind of to round out the presentation here this morning, um, a couple examples. So this is an example I put together to kind of really show how everything is put together. So we'll kind of start with step one is identifying the applicant's total need. You know, I put in an example of they need $100,000 to help their business with COVID relief. They're going to put in hand washing stations and sanitation stations. They're gonna do COVID tracking between people, et cetera. So the next step is identify total assistance available. Um, so this, again, I kind of listed out some of these items. You know, the COVID relief fund, private insurance, the SBA grants, which is your PVP, and then other federal, state, local government assistance or private assistance, charitable contributions. So their total assistance available, you know, the 35 plus 20 plus 50 gives them $105,000 of assistance available. The next step is identifying the amount of total assistance to exclude as non-duplicative. So this is where most people kind of get tripped up. You know, you're, you're excluding the non-duplicative amounts. So you have to understand the purpose of each of your funds and what is for certain items. So in this example, $75,000 is non-duplicative. And that was, you know, a certain amount for a certain function from insurance. You know, it covers operating costs only. So that gives a possible duplication of benefits amounts. The, you know, item two, the total assistance less, what's non-duplicative. So $30,000 is duplicative amounts that overlap in their purposes. The next step is calculating the maximum award. This is usually laid out in the Federal Register um, through the CDFA, through the SBA um, for the specific program. So for this instance, based on all the programs, this example, they were maximum award of about $70,000. And then the final award, you know, I'm sorry, I missed one step. The program cap is $100,000. And so the final award is gonna be the $70,000. So like I said, step three is identifying the amount of total assistance to exclude as non-duplicative that's kind of where the documentation really needs to line up and you need to understand what money for is for each specific purpose. The next example here, you know, a small business requests a grant for working capital funds to retain employees that would otherwise be laid off due to the economic impact of coronavirus, you know, they need three months of assistance to make it through. 
So they determined, you know, via underwriting, they went to a bank and said, how much is it going to take to keep our employees on the payroll, keep our business open for three more months? And they found, you know, $10,000 a month and over the three months, and they need $30,000 as their total assistance. So in this, in this example, the applicant was asked to report if it was receiving any additional or similar assistance or had made any claims on existing business insurance. So again, they need to determine what's the total assistance available if they're a prudent person. You know, the business reported that it did receive a PPP loan, but that assistance did run out. You know, part of this is saying the business claims that business interruption insurance was declined and the insurance said that it's not going to pay anything for insurance claim, which in the past nine months, we in the fraud and forensic, and we work a lot with insurance companies it is a very hot topic being discussed. And I know there's been a lot of court cases and not many decisions being made as far as business interruption insurance and what, and what, insurance companies will cover as far as a pandemic. Uh, typically that's singled out as an exception and doesn't get paid out. But we'll kind of stick with this example here. So step three is, you know, they found their total need that $30,000. They're not getting any other assistance at that point. So the actual unmet need, the maximum award is $30,000 and they will be able to get that $30,000 and no duplication of benefits is identified. And kind of my final example here today, you know, is a family that suffered a job loss due to the, pen, due to the economic impact of COVID and they're seeking rental assistance under CDBG emergency payments for three months of arrears and two months of current and future rent. You know, step one, again, assessing the needs. If their monthly rent is $1,000, their total need is five times that of $5,000. And again, the next step is what is the total assistance available and what are they expecting to receive beyond just the CDBG funds? So the applicant reported that they do have a faith-based organization, you know, it could be a church, any charitable organization. And that organization is providing them $250 for the past three months that they're in arrears, but that aid is no longer available. And they're saying they're not getting anything else from any other source. So they're, they're step three, you know, their total need is the $5,000, but they're getting other assistance of $750. Therefore, they're only going to be able to get $4,250 for the CDBG. Otherwise, if they did get the entire $5,000 from the CDBG, they would have a duplication of benefits and they would be liable to pay that back. So that's what I wanted to go over today. Um, again, questions and comments. Uh, we'd be happy to answer some general questions and specific questions myself and the CDFA will be taking today and then we'll be responding to you in the next few days as we do our research. So Alex or Chris, I don't know if you've been monitoring the chats and questions coming in, if there is any that you saw that we could take today or if there's some that we need to record and write down and get back to people specifically afterwards. Yes, I have been monitoring them. And so what I will do is I'll read them off for you, Dan, so you can answer them and we make sure that we get, everybody gets the answers that they need. Most of them are actually pretty broad. So the first one that I have, uh, I believe it's a clarification question. It, she asked, is the total need our total annual operating budget for all our programs or only for the program for which we need the CDBG CV grant? The total need is going to be program specific. 
So, you know, if you have a wide ranging business that does five different things, but only one program is affected by the COVID and had that economic disruption, that's going to be your total need. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next question. And the last example is the family required to apply for other potential sources of assistance before they can be granted CDBG funds? Yes, they should. Um, again, this is if there's assistance available to what a prudent and reasonable person is entitled to. Um, Again, rental assistance, I know in the new CARES Act, they did do specific rental assistance, but yes, they should be reaching out to other places and if they either get declined or you know they do the research and say, I can't find anything, that's fine. And then they can keep going on with the CDBG. But as long as they state that, yes, I did prudent research, I couldn't get anything else, you're our last hope, what can I get, that that's okay. On that point, Dan, wasn't there something recently put out by HUD that may have allowed some lacks on this part for the CARES Act funds? I that they not have to apply and certify that they applied. I think we should look into that because I believe one of the last um, Q and A's from uh, did say that there may be some laxness on this requirement only for CDBG CV CARES Act funds. Yes, and I could definitely come back and look at that research and confirm that. Perfect, thank you. For, and for anything where we're gonna say we're gonna confirm it, we will send it out with the additional materials um, as I stated earlier with the slides and those items as well. So moving on to the next question, let's see. Oh, this question is easy, I can, I can answer this. Uh, the form on the non-duplicative -dupl portion is very helpful. Will this be part of the slides available? And yes, Brenda, this will be available with the slides. Next question, uh, step three, I'm assuming, I'm hoping it's for the current slide. Uh, excluding non-duplicative amounts, does this mean we need to exclude the amounts that were for a specific need? And can you give more examples about this relevant to nonprofit service providers like a homeless shelter? Sure. So. When we talk about excluding the non-duplicative amounts, and you ask, does this mean exclude the amounts that were for a specific need? So the, the non, the, and it's almost better to look at it in the opposite direction where duplicative amounts are funds coming in from different sources for the same need of the recipient. So in a homeless shelter, if you need to increase the number of beds, have a few more people helping out, or just general supplies, and you get funds from CDBG and FEMA or the SBA, and some of those all go to you know, general supplies and buying beds and just increasing sanitation stations. Those are the, that's where you'll see the duplication of funds. Mm. I'm sorry, I was just trying to find the question again to make sure I answer it. Oh, I moved it to answered. Sorry. <laughs> there <we go. laughs> yeah. So if you get funds for a specific need, so a CDBG says, use these funds to buy beds and that's what you're allowed to do with these funds. And if you get funds from the SBA and they say these funds are for sanitation stations and buying other supplies, nothing there overlaps and therefore nothing is duplicative. 
So again, it, it is looking at the specific purpose of those funds and how they're going to be used. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I believe this is about the first DOB example. Where did the 75,000 from private insurance number come from? Above it says only 20,000 from private insurance. Yeah, it is a good catch. And I will make sure I update my slides before we send that out. And then that will adjust because that 75 and 20 should match. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, what is the time frame we should use in calculating the need? It's going to be the time frame to bring you to bring the business back to normal. Basically, um, so if you know it's going to take six months to get back to normal, or that's when normal funding is going to return to your business, or that's when normal revenue is going to return back to a business, that's going to be the time frame for your total need. If it's only if you only need assistance for one month, that's going to be your total need. So time frame is going to be different for every applicant based on the purpose they're going to use the funds for. Perfect. And I, I believe this might be something where if you have a question about your specific time frame, please pose it to us. Um, contact Dan and I separately because we can always get that for you and determine that help you determine that right I mean that that's similar to the PPP loans where certain businesses only needed a one month worth of payroll protection they know they're gonna pop right back up into business some businesses got the most possible at that time and it could be three months or more so again, it, it's really what brings you back, back to normal before COVID impacted your business. And this actually the next question is kind of related to what we were just talking about. Can we co please confirm the total need? Is the total need to respond to COVID within a program, not the total cost of running a program if COVID didn't exist? Right, so it, it's the need to respond to the impact that your business was affected. So if you think of a straight line, you know, typically it's um, business income loss is a good example of this where if, you're, um, if your revenue is a straight line, COVID made an impact and you kind of just have a little pothole there, you know, what's gonna bring you back up to normal? A uh, couple more. On the worksheet, private assistance included charitable contributions. Is that figure in kind donations only or all donations? And what time frames should those numbers be pulled from? So the charitable contributions could be cash or in kind donations. Again, you know, if you go to, if a church comes out and says, we'll be able to provide you $5,000 in cash and you could use, we happen to have bulldozers or whatever a church might have to assist those in-kind donations. That should all be included. And again, this time frame is expenses that are paid. Um, Alex, you would have to help me on the time frame on who the starting date of this, but you know, as long as the need is in that time frame, that's everything that should be included. Correct, and I think it varies for between the two programs. And again, I think this is one of those where if you have a specific question about your project or uh, your micro enterprise program, please let us know, and we're happy to assist you directly on that piece. I think time frames can can vary. We do know we have the allowable within March, after March 2020, that all expenses after that point are allowable within the CARES Act. So I, I would just ask that you 
And then each program has its own specific time frames, but we, we do ask that you ask us specifically if you do have a question about your specific time frame, if it may not adhere as cleanly as you think to what the program parameters are. All right, how do, on the, on the, I think we will have to provide additional guidance on this. How do we define that assistance has run out? We seem to have to include PPP, IDLE, and New Hampshire Main Street in our assistance calculation, but clearly companies used up those funds a long time ago. Right, so again, um, if you did get PPP and you used it up, you used it properly, but now it's done and over and you still have a need, then it's kind of done and over. And you know, if you still have that need, you still have that need, even though everything is done. You know, if assistance is run out, you know, PVP, you got your one time. I know they're coming out with the second PVP loan here shortly. So it will be able to reapply, but you know, if that first one was run out, it's run out. And as long as you document that you used it in the right way and you used it all up, then that's all you need to show. Great. So we are expanding services to hire someone to specifically assist those economically impacted by COVID. We have funds grant to cover the current services, but not the added staff. Do I need to show these positions covered since this is a new position that I don't have funds for? And I know this sounds a little more specific, Daniel, but we do actually have a few people that are doing this specific service. Sure. So that I would need to do a little bit more research. And if there's a few people with that question, I, I'd rather get the exact right information as far as adding a new staff position versus, like I said before, bringing you back up to where you were prior. Perfect. Uh, Tamara, if you can contact us and anyone else that might have a question uh, about adding staff with CDBG CB funds, and please let us know. We'll happily answer that for you. All right. Should the PPP loan be included as a duplication if it was for a total different need than the CARES grant will cover? No. So again, if PPP is, you're going to use it strictly for payroll and your utilities and the grant you're gonna use for, I'll use the homeless shelter again, general supplies, beds, et cetera. They're completely different, therefore they are non-duplicative. Uh, next question, I think it, it about time frame. How far back do we need to look for total need to the start of the pandemic? I think we've covered this a little bit, is that time frame really is dependent on program and overall need for that program related to COVID expenditures. And again, please, I, th I think we do need to be a little bit more specific programmatically um, for both programs, the public services and micro enterprise. And we will send that out to all of you with the additional materials so you can better determine where your time frame exists and what you should account for within for DOB within that time frame. All right, another question about adding staff. Okay, we'll answer that. Okay. There's some in the chat to you, I apologize. Uh, what about folks that are looking to use these funds to purchase specific items for their business. For example, computer equipment to make a move running their business online. Right, again, um, these funds are just for COVID. The CD, CDBG CV funds are COVID specific funds and not necessarily for the general benefit of a business. So if you could show that, you know, buying computer equipment to move online, you know, you're either preventing a COVID impact, preparing in response to COVID specifically, then it may be okay. But if you're just going to use the funds to advance your business, not so much. Great. 
Great. One last question. And I think this is a little bit more programmatic for the microenterprise program. Uh, the available funds is 25,000 per grantee. Do they need, um, and well, it's per beneficiary for the program, but do they need to provide documentation for the total deficit the grant is being applied to, and not just for an amount equal to the 2,500? I'm not certain I understand the question. Do you understand it, Dan, or do we need to get it clarified? I, I think I would need that one to be clarified. Yeah, I, I think it, it's, what I'm assuming it is about, is about the microenterprise program and how each grant is being accounted for, for the business overall. And I, I'm, I'm, I guess I, I, it's a little too broad for me to answer easily. If, if you could email me your question specifically and we'll have we'll happily answer that for you i apologize that we weren't able to do so right now um someone asked what is the deadline for the application well these app these this is for programs that have already been applied to so there is no open application for cdbgc fee funds at the moment uh, so we will be announcing additional cdbgc rounds in the future but as of right now every, these are all for current awards. And I believe that is all of the questions answered. So at this point, I wanna thank everybody for coming and for all of your questions. We will be emailing all of the attendees. Um, as I said at the beginning, the recording, the slides, and any additional materials. So it sounded like some things we did need to clarify and we will happily do that for you. We will also be sending out all contact information so you can contact us with your specific questions directly. Daniel will be available for consultation on specific project questions. And again, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for the presentation. I really appreciate well, it. Thank you for allowing me to come and provide my knowledge that I do have. And I, I will be happy to answer everyone's specific questions you know, once Alex sends out our contact information, you send those back to us. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a great day.